Um, I got to start today's prophecy update this way. Um, something happened last week on Wednesday. And for those of you who are students of Bible prophecy, I'm certain it did not escape your notice, but not only was it historic, it was profoundly prophetic. And what I'm speaking of is the meeting in Sochi, Russia, that Putin had with Erdogan of Turkey and Rouhani of Iran. Now listen, I, I went through my notes this morning and I had to redo a lot of them because um, what happened last week has never happened before in history. And I don't know if it's possible to, and I, I know that saying this this way has the potential of coming off sensational, and I don't want to do that. I think those of you who know me well enough know that I'm not like that. I mean, if something happens and it has prophetic significance, I'm going to tell you that. But if something happens that has unprecedented prophetic significance, I'm going to tell you that too. And that's what's happened. This has never happened before. Let me uh, see if I can uh, put this in uh, perspective and you'll bear with me. Right? <laughs> so. Didn't hear any amens on that one, so but we'll just assume that you'll bear with me. In 1978, let's just say that, just to put it into perspective, that we're having a prophecy update in 1978. You know what's happening in 1978 at that time? Iran is one of Israel's greatest allies. Iran! This is pre-1979, when it became the Islamic Republic of Iran under the Ayatollah. That was 1978. Let's say we're still in 1978 and we're doing a prophecy update. How about Turkey? Turkey was the place where the Israeli would go to vacation. Turkey! an ally of Israel, a friend to Israel. 1978. Here we are today, 2017. Russia, Iran, and Turkey. I'll call them the big three. And I'll call them the big three because they're the main three that will be at the helm of this alliance, chiefly with Russia and Iran, that is prophesied about in Ezekiel chapter 38, some 2,500 plus years ago. I want to put a slide up, especially for the benefit of those for whom Ezekiel 38 is unfamiliar. It's probably one of the most important prophecies in all of the Bible. And it foretells this allied attack against Israel. And I just want to take you through it quickly. And I want to read beginning in verse 1. I'll read through to verse 8. And then I want to read verse 13. Uh, let me preface it this way again at the risk of sounding sensational. As I read this, we are reading today's news. What I'm about to read and explain is happening now. Now. It has never happened before. It is happening now. Listen, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. Who's that? Oh, the modern day area known today as Russia. The chief prince of Meshach, 
and to Baal, prophesy against him, this is the leader, and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Listen, verse 5. Persia, Iran. In the last century, they were called Persia. This name change to the modern day name of Iran was just in the last century. Up until that point, they were always known as Persia. And by the way, uh, in Iran, they're not Arabs, they're Persians. And they don't speak Arabic, they speak Farsi. These are Persians. Then Kush. Kush is the northern area known today of Ethiopia and Sudan. And then the next nation by its ancient name is Put. And this is modern day Libya and also including parts of North Africa. Will be with them, with who? With Iran and Russia, with shields and helmets. Verse six, here's another nation. Gamr, with all its troops, and interesting, Beth Togarma, Beth in, or Beth in Hebrew is the same word in Arabic. It's house, the house of Togarma. We would call Saudi, the Saudi Ibn uh, Beth Saud, the house of Saud. So this is the house of Togarma, or known today, Gamar and Beit Togarma as Turkey. That's Turkey. Gamar and, and by the way, we know that because of the uh, ancient records, but it says in Ezekiel, from the far north with all its troops and the many nations with you. So if you get a map like I have here and you go all the way to the north, that is Turkey. Get ready, verse 7, be prepared, you and all the hordes gathered about you, and take command of them. After many days you will be called to arms. In future years you will invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, almost 2,000 years. They had been brought out from the nations, and now all of them live in safety, better translated in security and prosperity, which explains what we're about to read in verse 13. Listen, Sheba and Dedan. Who's that? Oh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Oh, they're, they're aligned with Russia and Iran and Turkey? No. Listen to this. And the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages, or as some of your translations render it, the young lions thereof. These are the young countries, which is why some believe this is a reference to the UK, of which the national symbol is a lion, and the young nations from the UK, the US. So... If that's the case, then what do Saudi Arabia and the UK and the US do? Oh, they just protest. They question the attack. Listen to what they ask. Have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot, to carry off silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, and to seize much plunder? Or, as another translation renders it, to take a spoil? This presupposes that there's a spoil to take in Israel. Oh, is there? You know there is. You remember, it wasn't that long ago that they found natural gas and oil that makes the oil and natural gas in Saudi Arabia and even Russia look like child's play. Oh, you're exaggerating. Not really. 
There is so much oil and natural gas that Israel has now. Not to mention the technology, the prosperity. Israel is dwelling securely and is prospering like no other nation on earth today. And the spoil is there for the taking. And make no mistake about it, this is exactly what is happening. And this is exactly what this is about. What we witnessed this last week with Russia, Iran, and Turkey is now, I believe, the aligning of every nation to a nation exactly as was recorded in this prophecy in Ezekiel. I want to very quickly have you consider the following breaking news reports out of Israel. And I want you to, as I quote from them, know that they were just from the last few days, just the last few days. Let's start with this Ynet news report on Wednesday. They refer to this meeting as Putin's victory summit. <laughs> this meeting with Erdogan and Rouhani. Putin, in discussing what he calls Syria's post-war prospects, was quoted as saying, we've reached a new phase. Now, of course, he's um, declaring victory over the Islamic State, which I think the jury is still out. There does seem to be a vacuum now that is created certainly in Syria as well as Iraq. But here's what's interesting. The Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, paid a visit to the Sochi resort there in Russia where the leaders were meeting. And according to Wynet, Putin told Rouhani and Erdogan that, quote, Syria's collapse, Syria's collapse, was prevented thanks to the country's trilateral efforts. Serious collapse? Yeah. I'll continue. President Rouhani replied that the time was right for a political settlement of the conflict and that he was pleased that Russia, Turkey, and Iran were collaborating so closely on the issue of, get this, Syrian peace. Syrian peace? but nevertheless emphasize that foreign intervention in Syria must cease. What? Wait, foreign, who's he talking about? Oh, you know who he's talking about. The United States of America. The great Satan, remember? Any foreign military presence in the country is only legitimate if it enters at the behest of the Syrian government. Well, that's not going to happen. The Kremlin added, Putin also intends to speak with other leaders about the Syrian conflict. These have already included, listen, just this last week, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, with whom he spoke on Tuesday for half an hour, U.S. President Donald Trump, with whom he spoke for an hour on Tuesday, and, oh, Saudi King Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud. You know who that is? That's the father of bin Salman, Mohammed bin Salman, who we talked about at length last week, soon many believe to be crowned king in Saudi Arabia. Several interesting details stand out here, and I want to take just a moment and point them out before we go any further. First, notice, I don't know if you caught this or not, but Russia is now, the prominence of Russia in Syria and in the Middle East, the geopolitical landscape of the Middle East is contrasted with America's absence. It wasn't that long ago that nobody did anything in the Middle East unless America signed off on it first. Not anymore. Thanks to the previous administration, dare I say, 
The United States of America has become inconsequential in the Middle East, and one Barack Hussein Obama basically signed over the title deed of the Middle East, specifically in Syria, to Russia. Russia. Please don't be ignorant. I'm not saying you are. I'm just, that's what the Apostle Paul said in many of his epistles. Don't be ignorant. Please. Another detail I want you to notice. There's this conspicuous alignment of sorts between, who knew, (laughs) Saudi Arabia and the U.S. and Israel? Yeah. Wait. Isn't that exactly what we just read in verse 13 of Ezekiel 38? Keep in mind, Saudi Arabia are Sunni Muslims, and in Iran they are Shiite Muslims. And please know that in Saudi Arabia you have Mecca and Medina, and that's a problem for Iran. And so now you have Saudi Arabia at odds with Iran for that reason and with Russia for another reason. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. One more detail. Um, The only reason Syria is not a ruinous heap yet, according to Isaiah 17, is because Russia, Iran, and I'll add Turkey still need Syria as a means to an end. What is that end? And why are they in Syria? Oh, they're in Syria because they want to attack Israel from the north, exactly as Ezekiel 38 says. And to me, the question isn't so much that of why they're in Syria. I mean, that they're in Syria. They are in Syria. The question is why? And here's why. Iran, via Russia, has military installations in Syria within about 30 to 35 miles of Israeli territory in the Golan. For those of you who go to Israel with us, we go to the Golan, you can actually see Damascus. Sometimes you can hear it if there's uh, warfare going on from the Golan. I remember one time uh, our tour guide told us, and he wasn't, uh, you know, exaggerating. He said, we know what newspaper Bashar al-Assad is reading in Damascus from Israel. (laughs) They know everything that's going on. It's that close. It's that close. Okay, so um, Iran is there now establishing these uh, military installations. Um, Why? And uh, what's in it for Iran? And what's in it for Russia? Well, I believe that Russia and Iran are keeping Syria propped up for different reasons. For Russia, it's economic, and for Iran, it's prophetic. Let me start with Iran and this breaking Israel news report in which they ask this question. Is Iran trying to bring Islamic end of days in Syria? Answer is yes, by the way. Spoiler alert, but let me just quote the article. (laughs) Iran is establishing bases in Syria, but according to some sources, their preparations to engage Israel are motivated far more by messianic aspirations than military or political ones. The escalation of Iranian military efforts in Syria are religiously motivated, Ryan Morrow, a political analyst for the Clarion Project, explained. To the Iranian regime, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. <laughs> Not Bible prophecy, Islamic prophecy. Islam's tradition holds that Mahdi is the redeemer of Islam. Listen to this. The arrival of Mahdi, this is the Muslim Messiah, if I can say it that way, they believe will coincide with the arrival of the Christian Messiah, (laughs) who will be the Mahdi's assistant in fighting the Masih ad-Dajjal, that's Arabic for the Antichrist or the false messiah. 
So Jesus, is, according to Islamic eschatology or prophecy, uh, Jesus is going to come to assist uh, this Mahdi uh, to bring about the fulfillment of Islamic prophecy. Are you still with me here on this? It gets worse, so I just want to make sure you're okay before I read on. <laughs> The Mahdi will reappear along with Jesus, who will declare himself a Muslim. <laughs> okay, all right. And, oh, listen to this, and kill Christians who refuse to convert. Shia Islam holds that the end of days will be a bloody battle. And this is interesting. Killing off two-thirds of the world population. That's in Revelation, by the way. And leaving the rest to convert to Islam. In a speech in front of the UN General Assembly in 2008, in fact, I remember the prophecy update that year, Former Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad left the gathered politicians aghast as he explicitly begged Allah to hasten the return of the Mahdi. Iran believes they will lead the battle against Sunni adversaries, continue down into Israel, and eventually take over Jerusalem. Oh, that explains a lot, doesn't it? He believes that the recent destabilization in Saudi Arabia is a direct result of Iran's apocalyptic agenda. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, please, please, please. If this is not Ezekiel 38, I don't know what is. I don't know how else to say it. I don't want to scream and yell, you know I can. I'm telling you, if this is not Ezekiel 38, I don't know what is. That's why Iran is there. That's why Iran needs Syria there. How about Russia? Oh, let's talk about Russia in this Russia Times article from Friday with the headline, Putin crowned world's energy czar with Saudis bowing to reality. Let me quote quickly the Times. Russian President Vladimir Putin has become the most influential player in the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, also known as OPEC. The Russian leader is currently calling all the shots. One senior OPEC official told Bloomberg on condition of anonymity. Russia, which is not even a member of the group, has reportedly stolen Saudi power, which for many years was overwhelming when Riyadh could move crude prices with just a few words. Putin is now the world's energy czar, said Halima Croft, an analyst who directs global commodity strategy at New York-based RBC Capital Markets, as quoted by the media. The energy czar? Oh, wait a minute. So is that what Ezekiel is talking about, about the spoil? One has suggested all you have to do is take the SP off a of spoil and you have oil. That's what Russia wants. That's why Russia is in Syria. And that's why Russia and Iran together with Turkey et al. are all at the ready to attack Israel. For Iran is the fulfillment of Islamic prophecy as satanic as it is, by the way, and blasphemous as it is. And for Russia, it's all about the money. It's all about the spoil. It's all about the oil and the natural gas. Well, I believe that it's just a matter of time before the Russian-Iranian-led alliance of nations makes their fatal move. And I say fatal, not for Israel, but for them. You wanna know why? Oh, 
Ezekiel 38 goes on to declare that God's hot anger will be aroused, so much so that God will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on them that they will know that he is God. That's how it ends for them. Not for Israel. Not for Israel. Um, it has to do with uh, what the Bible calls an everlasting covenant. You know what everlasting means? It, I'm going to quit hitting the mic now, but it means <laughs> it lasts forever. He has a covenant with Israel. Let me see if I can bring this to a close. It's happening very fast. Um, I have to confess that this has uh, got me a little bit taken back by just how fast all of this is coming to pass. I was thinking about this yesterday, I think it was, that it's like being in a car driving very fast in order to arrive at your final destination. And the closer you get, the more frequent the signs are. I was reminded of a experience that my wife and I had in 1997. We were staying with my aunt in uh, Egypt. She lives in uh, Giza. She's actually in Australia part of the year. And then she has a place in Egypt uh, Giza is where the pyramids are. So we were staying with my aunt, but we wanted to go to Alexandria and we had to go by way of train from Cairo. But because of the traffic, uh, we got, this is 1997. This is BC, not before Christ, before children, <laughs> when we could travel. <laughs> and we um, missed our train from Cairo to Alexandria, which is my father's birthplace there on the Mediterranean. Beautiful, beautiful. And so we ended up having to take a cab. Um, when I say that this was the cab ride from H-E double toothpicks, I mean this was the cab ride from H-E double toothpicks. I thought for sure this is how it ends. We're going to see Jesus. So we're driving. It's about a, depending on how fast you drive. You know, it's a couple hours. Well, apparently this um, uh, cab driver wanted to get there in world record setting time. So he's driving very fast and no AC and it is so hot and we've got the windows down and my wife's in the back seat and she's got her sunglasses on. It's kind of funny because when we finally arrived, she took her sunglasses off and she had raccoon eyes because it was all <laughs> dirt from, you know, the... <laughs> I mean, it was, anyway, so it was so frightening. At one point, I told in my native tongue of Arabic, my uh, fellow uh, Arab uh, cab driver, um, who wouldn't see Jesus if we, <laughs> but I, I basically told him uh, in Arabic, if you don't slow down, uh, I will not pay you one penny when we arrive in Alexandria. And you can let us out here if you want. I was hoping you wouldn't, because, <laughs> yikes. Uh, so he, he slowed down, uh, but not very much and not for very long. Well, what happened was um, I began to take notice of the signs to see just how close we were to arriving at our destination in Alexandria. And I have to tell you that the closer we got, the more frequent those signs became and how encouraging were those signs, especially one of the last ones that said you're only a couple of kilometers from Alexandria. I'm like, oh, Jesus, thank you. Hallelujah, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. But the closer we got, the more frequent the signs. And that's how I see what's happening today. The closer we get, the more frequent and welcoming, I might add, <laughs> those signs become. 
I think about what Jesus said, it's recorded in Matthew. Talk about the harsh words in our uh, study in Galatians. The harshest words from the Savior's mouth were for the, the legalists and the hypocrites and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and such is the case here in Matthew 16 verses 1 through 3. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came and they wanted to test Jesus and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. This was Jesus' answer. When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Wow. You know, my hope, I mean, with any in every prophecy update that we have, it's always my hope that it in some way is a help to you. But particularly for today, I hope that in some way today's update has been some help in better interpreting the signs of the times. The signs for Ezekiel 38 are there and they're coming more frequently as we get closer. And interesting with those signs, uh, when we were there, uh, as we got closer to Alexandria, the signs became more detailed. The signs became more detailed with more information. And I see Bible prophecy that way. We are seeing with specificity the details of these prophecies in these signs that I hope we're interpreting. Here's the bottom line. It's what Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, and the key word in what he said is beginning. He says this, when you see these things begin, begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. We're seeing Ezekiel 38 begin to come to pass. And Jesus said, when you see that sign, interpret those signs that are beginning to come to pass and look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. Now, um, I would be disingenuous if I didn't close by telling you that that only applies to you if you're born again of the Spirit of God. Jesus said, a man, a woman must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm almost done if you'll just be patient with me and I know you're patient with me and I appreciate it. But this is so important, please. I just need your attention for a couple more minutes. You must be born again. If you have never been born again of the spirit of God, your redemption doesn't draw an eye, judgment draws an eye and unspeakable horror and terror during the seven year tribulation is what draws an eye. For those of us who are born again of the Spirit, what draws nigh is our redemption, the rapture of the church when Jesus comes and takes us out before the seven-year tribulation. So maybe the question for you today is, um, how do I become born again? Well, I want to share with you how, and I want to start by way of the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ using what's known as the ABCs of salvation. First, the A is for admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a savior. This is Romans 3.10 that says, there is no one righteous, not even one. And Romans 3.23 that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's Romans 6, 23 that says, for the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And then the C is for call upon the name of the Lord, or if you prefer, confess with your mouth, which is what Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says. 
that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And here's all you have to do. Call, Romans 10, 13, upon the name of the Lord. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And here's what happens when you do. When you call upon the name of the Lord, he then gives you the Holy Spirit who now indwells you and seals you. The Holy Spirit seals you. You are now saved And the seed of God's word has been met with the fertility, or if you prefer, the egg of your life. And there's conception. That's how you know you've been born again, spiritually. If you're born physically, how do you know? Oh my goodness. (laughs) There's conception. The seed has implanted the egg, and there's conception, and there's new life. And when that baby's born, what happens? Oh my goodness. That thing wants to be nursed every day and every night. Just ask uh, any woman here who's nursed their babies. And they're so hungry and they need to be fed. And that's how you know you're born again, that there's been conception because now you crave the milk of God's word. And then as you begin to grow, you go from crawling to walking. And you go from, and you start teething. Boy, remember those days, parents? Yeah. When your kids were teething, they're growing their teeth. And then now all of a sudden they don't need the milk anymore. Now they're ready for solids. And as we grow spiritually, we begin to eat the meat of God's word. And we go from being children of God to men and women of God as we mature in Christ and grow in grace. And that's what happens. And that's how it is to be born again. Why don't you stand and we'll pray and I'll just simply ask for anyone here today that has never called upon the name of the Lord, has never been born again of the Spirit of God, that today you would humble yourself Acknowledge your sin. Believing in your heart, Jesus Christ is Lord, that he was crucified, buried, and rose again from the dead is even now seated at the right hand of the Father. And that you would confess with your mouth and call upon the name of the Lord so that you will be saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I I thank you for the free gift of eternal life. Free to us, it costs you everything, your very life. I thank you that we're saved by grace through faith, that it is a gift from you, and it's not of works, anything that we can earn lest we should boast. Lord, I thank you that there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do, because you did it all for us, and instead of us. So Lord, I just pray for anyone here today or watching online that has never called upon you that today would be the day of their salvation, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.